Approaching a unique style of gameplay can be a huge turnoff for your game, if not handled very carefully. Humans are creatures of habit, likely to stick to what they most enjoyed first learning in video games. For instance, Sonic is a lot harder to get into if you've played Mario first. Smash Bros. is a way easier fighting game to tackle than Street Fighter due to its platformer roots, and that it's just Kirby Superstar but with Italian Popeye and Jackal Goku. And Pac-Man, for some reason. Methodical shooters are harder to get into than those where you go in guns blazing, unless you're running on tank controls and forcing the player to go slow. So what's a good way to create divergent gameplay? To make a scenario that the player wants to overcome, and naturally come to grips with a new way to play. And more importantly, how do you make this decision feel like one of their own, instead of one they were tutorialized or forced into? Huh? Whose footprints are these? Huh? What was that noise? Huh? Whose footprints are these? Huh? What was that noise? Genius. Metal Gear Solid had an uphill battle to climb on its release. A game centered around stealth and avoiding combat seems antithetical to established video game conventions. Of previous entries in the Metal Gear series, only one made it to Western markets, and the NES port was a poor representation of the original, so the military stealth setting it was using was very unfamiliar to a Western audience. And though third-person shooters like Resident Evil were available and popular, they mostly focused on linear puzzles and solutions. MGS would have to, in its starting moments, not only establish the tone of the game, but prepare a player to handle its divergent gameplay style relatively quickly, to be willing to experiment and get out of their comfort zone. The heliport and the surrounding starting area of Shadow Moses Island set out to do just that. The first room of Metal Gear Solid, rather than taking a moment to teach the player anything, throws them right into the action. Snake is unarmed, having only a close-range kick combo, and the ability to grab enemies from behind as... Weapons and equipment, OSP. Yes, this is a top-secret black op. They're given a small area to play around with how Snake controls without fear, and then can crawl under a pipe to get into the game. The first room contains two enemies, with the player forced to avoid their field of vision while waiting for an elevator to lower. A player's first instinct is normally to defeat enemies they see. That's just how video games tend to work. So while they might try to play the game stealthy, chances are a new player will attack the genome soldiers, if only because they might think they'll lower the elevator. And even if Colonel tells you to wait, what else are you going to do? Not kill them? Well this... this is generally a pretty bad idea. Snake's life bar grows longer through Metal Gear Solid, starting at a pitifully low amount. Furthermore, only a stranglehold from behind can actually kill the guards, Punching them into submission only temporarily knocks them out, and they wake up fast enough that it does Snake a little good. This means carefully watching a guard's path, waiting for your opportunity, hoping that they won't turn around, getting into range, and strangling him before the other guard comes to check up on him. Something made more difficult by diabolical puddles of water left in the room that dare to make sound when you cross over them preventing you from a straight dash to strangle a soldier. After enough credits have rolled, the elevator lowers, a third soldier coming down to check on his comrades, putting one last obstacle between Snake and actually entering Shadow Moses Island. While damage boosting to get right back in the action would be a valid strategy for other games, a player can't just run up and tank damage. The elevator won't work if you've alerted the guards. Only by actually sneaking around or running around this forklift until they stop noticing you, can Snake beat the first room of the game. From the very start, the player is forced into an uncomfortable position, weaker than the very first enemy that they see, and are allowed to handle it at their own pace. Nothing tells you that you can just leave the guards alive or simply avoid them. 
so the player's allowed to experiment all they want with their approaches until they can finally get up the elevator. This sort of experimental gameplay is reinforced tenfold when Snake ascends to the heliport. In contrast to the cramped docks below, the heliport has vast, open stretches of snow and metal to run across, and significantly more guards. By which I mean, four is more than two. There are some boxes similar to those found in the docks to the right, but trying to dance around them in the same way you learned how down there leads to... Huh? Whose footprints are these? ...forcing a hasty retreat. Instead, Metal Gear Solid lets the player experiment yet again. They can try to cross the helipad itself, taking the timing element of avoiding sight to its natural extreme as they try to run between massive spotlights, nabbing themselves some highly useful chaff grenades in the process. They can try to bait guards with the footprint mechanic or knocking on walls, dashing past them after they've been distracted by Snake's intimidating shoe size. There's a storage area to the left guarded by a surveillance camera, which is easily disabled by the chaff grenades found in the helipad, but can be slowly avoided with careful planning. The player is even able to get their first weapon, a SOCOM pistol, by sneaking into a truck, letting them finally take action against the soldiers. Only to realize that the gun not only makes a lot of noise, but has a much slower firing rate than the guard's machine guns making it more of a last-ditch desperation tool than a be-all, end-all to problems. Or they could totally ignore it, as the gun's totally optional, maybe never even realizing that it's there in the first place. Heck, if they wanted to, they could just try to run through and make a mad dash toward one of the vents that leads into the Shadow Moses tank hangar, just panicking and trying to find the best way to avoid gunfire as they escape to safety. The important thing is, all of these options for approach are valid, but they're all contrary to the standard run-and-gun mechanics established by similar third-person shooters and the stylings of the docks preceding. Methodical or rushed, trial and error or calculated, every new player's approach is taken into consideration and not validated, but challenged by the heliport. The placement of items further reinforces each player's choice. The SOCOM pistol is located right near the lower entrance to the tank hangar, making it easy to nab it, cap the sleeping guard in front, and crawl in before reinforcements take you out. The higher route, meanwhile, is far more dependent on the player's stealth skills, eventually rewarding them with the thermal goggles, a further aid in avoiding guards. In fact, the door to the thermal goggles actually seals itself if a player doesn't get it on the first go-round, requiring a keycard from much later in the game to access, giving a direct reward for the player's skill, even if it's less likely that the player will find the SOCOM if they go this route. Or a player looking to get everything in the environment is rewarded with both, at the cost of time and probably dying a few times in order to figure out all the different patterns. The tank hangar itself continues to employ out-of-the-box thinking. Trap doors litter the basement, making directly fleeing enemies more difficult and limiting movement options. The player needs to set and detonate C4 charges, but these appear in really limited numbers, so they have to make each charge count and can't experiment too freely. The hangar's boss... Revolver Ocelot is difficult to directly shoot as he has a nice, tied-up hostage in the way of your straight shots. In direct contrast to the very straightforward firefight encountered earlier in Snake's Infiltration. Hiding doesn't help, constantly being mobile and waiting for him to reload is the only way to overcome him. And of course, you can always talk to your team in order to get useful information including advice to use the seemingly useless cigarette item to reveal infrared lasers with their smoke. Or you could just use the thermal goggles if you got those earlier, or figure it out yourself. And of course, the cardboard box exists, so you could just play with that all you want. Just, just go for it, pal. It's, it's the box. Metal Gear Solid challenges the player not to overcome its obstacles, but figure out their own way of subverting the challenge that the obstacles present. Many games fall into the trap of separating their gameplay styles too harshly. This is the stealth section, 
Be good at stealth or else you fail. This is a big combat section, get those mashing fingers ready. Oh, I hope you like puzzles because you're going to have to play a whole bunch of Pipe Dream in order to progress. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with these approaches. At their best, they can be engaging as really standout moments. But it doesn't immediately endear the player to the gameplay style unless they're already attuned to it. And while Metal Gear Solid isn't totally immune from this either, I just love the opportunity it presents to not just give the player options, but let them mix and match them or change their style on the fly and let their skill take over. It's a design philosophy that I think is carried through each main Metal Gear title and is one of the reasons that its gameplay remains so enduring. The player is making a choice on how they want to handle things, often without realizing it. And that makes the whole experience just feel so much more natural. That's what makes love blue, even on the virtual battlefield. That's how the heliport shows the world how to design for divergence. Cause...